Hello everyone and welcome back to Towergate. It is Towergate day number 586, 586, October the 23rd, 2018, Tuesday. Thank you so much for tuning in. Okay, let's talk about the Salsa invasion. The Salsa invasion, which appears now to have swelled to 14,000 estimated people and growing. And now there's rumors that there's another group coming in behind them that's starting with about 2,000 salsa invaders. <clears throat> this is not your uncle's salsa either. Nope, this is something totally different. These invaders, it appears, are nearly if not more than 80% males under 35 who appear to be quite healthy and quite well dressed. They don't appear to be starving and wearing some awfully expensive designer clothing. Many of them. They are being assisted by the Mexican population who's helping and supporting them. It appears that the government officials in Mexico are now unwilling to do anything because they're looking at their own polls showing that the Mexican people largely are behind the salsa invasion. They're behind the invaders. So now it's become a political issue for uh, the leadership of Mexico because this, uh, these group of people have so much overwhelming support. <clears throat> Now, I'm not going to go back to what I talked about yesterday because we've already covered that ground about who is behind this. I think we all know who's behind this, Mr. Soros. So this could be a very big gift for the president and the Republicans if they play their cards right. And I know the president will. We'll see what the Republicans do. This will certainly bring out the Republican base. It may energize the Democratic base. Because <clears throat> it will be turned into a political football, which it is and has been for quite some time. Democrats will certainly try to exploit this. But most Americans will understand that that's exactly what is happening. Because the fact of the matter is, on this particular issue, it's a winner for Republicans. We've seen the polls for months and months now. The majority of people, including many Democrats, independents, it's over 60%, believe that we have to have some sort of control of our border. They do not support having people, thousands if not millions. Remember, we already let 1.3 million people uh, into this country every year from Central and Latin America. <clears throat> it's not like we don't let these people in. We allow about 1.3 million of these people to take up citizenship in this country every year. It's the illegal salsa caravan that we're talking about here. And you can't let them just come into the country because if they do, that will just send a message. Hey, guess what? America's open for business and you'll see a never ending flow of salsa caravans. It'll never end. They'll destroy the country by destroying the culture. Trump's right, no borders, no country. Most Americans, regardless of whether they're Republican, Democrat, or what have you, understand this. This is very simple. <clears throat> the Democrats are really badly overplaying their hand because they assume that this is a Republican slash Democrat issue. White versus black. They're wrong. And I got proof positive today that they're wrong. I walked into the break room this morning to get a cup of hot chocolate and a couple of uh, donuts, and I overheard a conversation between a handful of individuals where I work who are anti-Trumpers. Several of them are black, a couple of them are Latino, one's from North Africa, about five or six of them sitting around the table. And they're having a conversation, which I'm listening in on, and they're talking about how they do not support this group of migrants coming into the country, the salsa invasion. Because they're talking about, hey, man, I mean, these people come into, come into this country. I mean, that's what's driving down our wages. They're going to take our jobs. 
Exactly. So these, even anti-Trump, black and Latino anti-Trumpers where I work, sitting there talking about how this disadvantages them. They don't want the migrants here either. And we already know that Trump's support amongst blacks and Latinos has gone up three times since 2016, which is another reason why they're going to get their asses kicked in the midterms. So, how should the Republicans play it? Well, the way that they should play it <clears throat> is that Trump should get together with McConnell and Big Ears, Eddie Munster, Ryan. Probably Kevin Ryan because he's starting to move into the uh, uh, position now uh, as Ryan is fading out, stepping aside. You're seeing um, kind of a change. Hopefully that, that doesn't mean that Jim Jordan is not going to be in the... In, uh, in the running to be the speaker, and I'm certainly going to do everything I can, and I hope all you will as well, to try to push your representatives to support Jordan for speaker. But at this point, we can see it's McCarthy that's kind of making the moves. He's the one that's introduced this bill. He's uh, the to complete Trump's border wall and to have this immigration bill and to have a vote on that. He's the one that's kind of appearing on the programs. He's the one that's out traveling around the country raising money. Paul Ryan's essentially retired at this point. He's kind of taken himself out of the game, okay? But he is currently the speaker. So you've got to get the speaker. Uh, you've got to get the Senate majority leader. You've got to get the House majority leader. you got to get them into Trump's office. they got to sit down and have a conversation. And the way to do this is to have, is, is to uh, get a resolution, a resolution, a joint resolution from the House and the Senate asking the president to defend our border with our military. Now, the president can already do this. He doesn't need the Congress to do anything. He has the, uh, the authority, executive authority, under Article I to uh, defend our borders. He can send the military to the border without any asking anybody anything. He can simply do it on a presidential directive. But it would be politically wise if the Republicans uh, would get together with Trump that would mean McConnell, McCarthy, and uh, the majority leader get the leadership in there, maybe even bring in the Democratic leadership, uh, Schumer and Pelosi, and get a joint resolution asking the president to defend our border with the military against the Salsa invasion. What would this do? Well, number one, it would, it would show unity with the president and his party. Number two, it would take away the argument that Trump is acting as a dictator. Number three, it would show that the Republicans are actually the party which does want to defend our borders and cares about national security, not votes. And what it would also do is make the Democrats go on record. Make them go on record on an issue which we know that more than 60% of the people support the Republican uh, position. Make the Democrats, make Pelosi and Schumer vote against sending troops to the border to defend our border. Make them vote against it. Make all them Democrats running in all them House races. Make all them Democrats running in Senate races. Make them vote against asking the president to defend our national security at the border. Get them on record. Uh-huh. Oh, yes. That's exactly what you do if... You are a good political strategist, and you understand the game, which I do, and most of you do. So I say to you, leadership in the House, Republican, leadership in the House, get a joint resolution, get a vote, asking the president to defend our national security and our borders by sending the military to stop the salsa invasion. And in doing so, you will force the adversaries, the demo commies, the commiecrats, whatever you want to call them, you will force them to go on record two weeks before the election on whether they stand for national security, border security, or whether they stand for open borders and sanctuary cities, catch and release, chain migration, and all the rest, which is clearly out of scope with the majority of the country including many Democrats, including many Latinos, including many African Americans, and others. It's the smart play. Here's a question for you. 
I haven't talked much about this thing going on with Mr. Khashoggi, the so-called journalist, Saudi journalist who works for CNN, who came up uh, missing, disappeared, murdered, whatever you want to call it. I just want to let you know right now, we're never going to get to the truth of this, okay? We're not going to get the truth. What everyone's looking for is a convenient way that they can come up with something uh, that they can put out there for public consumption to make this all go away. Because they all want it to go away. The Saudis buy a hell of a lot of weapons from us. That means a lot of jobs, big government contracts, big military contracts. What's going on here? Well, the fact is, it's the deep state. It's not just the deep state in the United States. There's a deep state in the UK, as we found out and are finding out. We know there's a deep state in Australia. We know there's a deep state in Italy. We know there's a deep state in the EU. Well, there's also a very, very nasty deep state in the Middle East. We know about these rogue intelligence agencies, not just here in the United States or in Great Britain, and rogue elements of the government. They exist everywhere. And that is what's going on here. Now, the media wants to talk about Mr. Mich um, uh, Mr. Khashoggi being a journalist and saying some things that were not good about the Saudi royal family. <laughs> lots of people, lots of Saudis say things that are not good about the Saudi royal family, and they don't generally do this kind of thing to them. We're not going to get the truth here, but let me tell you what I think. It's just a shot in the dark. First of all, let's remember that this guy is not really what you... He, he could see maybe he has gone to journalism school, maybe he works for CNN, maybe he can be a journalist. But what he really is, is an activist. And the issue that he's most passionate about, writing about, and involved in, is the Palestinian issue. He's also perceived by the Israelis as being an anti-Semite. If you read Haaretz, the largest newspaper in Israel, they hate this guy. And they call him straight up an anti-Semite. And they say that he acts against the interest of Israel as he sides with the Palestinians. The most powerful lobby in Washington, D.C., the Israeli lobby, IPAC, they are constantly making it perfectly well known that Mr. Khashoggi and others like him are no friend of the Israelis. This guy didn't just piss off the Saudis. This guy pissed off the Israelis. And he's got some friends in Turkey, but he's also got some enemies there. Now, these intelligence agencies, they play both sides of the fence. Most of you know that. There's a lot of dirty, rogue players who have a lot of different alter, alter, alternative, ulterior motives, even motives that come into conflict, even within their own groups. It's a very complicated situation. But the truth probably is, and we'll never get to it, believe me, they'll find a way to muddy this water, to deal with this issue, and never really get resolution on it until it's been out there for a week or two and other things come along, the election comes along, other things, and they can push it to the back page and hope people forget because they don't want to tell the truth, including the president. <laughs> he doesn't want to touch this hot potato. This takes you down a road you don't want to go in because it gets into the dark underworld of the rogue intelligence agencies and rogue people in play in the Middle East. And we know that uh, Mossad, the Israeli intelligence agency, is very, very adept at these types of murders. They take people out, straight up. These rogue elements of Mossad are very closely intertwined with the intelligence service in Saudi Arabia, as well as other what what you would say, I guess, is rogue uh, elements in Turkey. The Israeli intelligence is deeply embedded into every government in, middle, in the Middle East, in the Mediterranean, North Africa, and, and pretty much around the world, even in Western countries. Deeply embedded, and I think we all know that. So this is not like an anti-Israeli rant. I'm not an anti-Semite uh, or anything like that. I'm just telling you the truth, my friends. There's dirty players here. They're deep state players, the rogue elements of intelligence agencies, and people who work for them, people who have aligned interests with them. And this guy was taken out likely 
because he's made enemies with the wrong people. The Israelis, the Saudis, and, uh, you know, there's probably even some elements because the Israelis and Saudis have their own elements in Turkey, even though there's issues. But it's a complicated relationship with Saudi Arabia and, and Israel with Turkey. They have different motives. They have, but they almost, in a way, they're kind of forced, thrown together because of certain interests, which they have to be together on. At the same time, they have big problems with each other. There has been an ongoing issue between Turkey and Israel for a long time. They tolerate one another, at best. The same with Saudi Arabia. They tolerate Turkey. So it's hard to say exactly the names of the, you'll never get the names of the individuals that pull this off. Now I have no doubt if enough pressure is brought that they will scare up a couple of mid-level uh, intelligence guys in Saudi Arabia. If they're forced to, they'll throw these guys under the bus to put this thing away. But I'm telling you, we'll never get to the real truth about who's really behind that or even what happened. But you can bet it's deep state intelligence operatives in Saudi Arabia and Israel that made this sucker disappear. And in a very ugly way, most likely. And uh, we'll never get to the bottom of it. We'll never get to the truth. It'll be some sort of a cover-up. But um, Trump certainly doesn't want to cancel the military contracts. He doesn't. They certainly do not want to have to expose the fact that there may have been Israeli intelligence involved. That's why you won't see anywhere on the media They'll just keep telling you this guy was saying bad things about the Saudis. When in fact his greatest passion was his advocacy for the Palestinians and his activism for the Palestinian cause and his distaste and hatred for the Israelis. That's who he really pissed off. We'll never get to the truth about that, about that I can assure you. So feel free to speculate all you like. Trump's approval has hit 47%. Compared to the same time in Obama's presidency, he was at 45. This is extraordinary. Absolutely extraordinary. Because Obama was loved and adored and worshipped by the corporate media. They gave him a pass on everything. Covered up all his lies. Covered up all his mistakes. Worshipped him like he was a god. Day in and day out. Never said a harsh word about Barack Hussein Obama. Trump, on the other hand, they've massacred him. Even before he was president. Started when he was a candidate. Day in, day out. 365 days a year. 24 hours a day. Nothing but anti-Trump. They've accused him of being a fascist. An orange Hitler. Uh, you name it. You name it. He's been accused of everything. Non-stop pounding on the man day after day after day. Yet somehow, he's, he's two points more popular than Barack Hussein. Can you imagine what Trump's numbers would look like if he had gotten the same treatment from the liberal media that, uh, that Barack Obama got? He'd be at 90%. Fortunately, the people are smarter than the left-wing media. Much smarter and a lot more are waking up. And if you want to be confirm that, just take a trip down to Texas tonight where you will find over 100,000, 100,000 people at the rally for Ted Cruz, who's not exactly loved. He's right on a lot of issues, but he's not a real lovable guy. He certainly couldn't draw 100,000 himself. They're there to see Trump. <clears throat> but they'll support Ted Cruz. And all that money pouring into Beto O'Rourke, the drunken doofus, won't help him a bit. Because you can't buy people all the time. You can buy some dummies. Most of them registered Democrats. In fact, all of them registered Democrats. You can buy those people. They're dumber than soap. Dumber than a bar of soap. But you can't buy Trump supporters, and you can't buy independent voters who are independent thinkers. You look at the election every year. They don't follow politics. They just look at the economy. They look at what's going on. They look at their jobs, their personal situation, their tax situation. They look at foreign policy. They look around them. They talk to some friends, and they go vote 
and they vote either for a Republican or a Democrat, whoever thinks the best guy for the job. If they like the job the guy's doing, they continue to vote for him. If they like what they see, they vote for that party. If they don't like what they see, they vote against that party. That's about 20, 25, maybe 30 percent of the electorate vote that way. Clearly, when you see the numbers Trump is getting, you see his approval rating, despite the uh, despicable beating he takes every day from the media, it's pretty obvious where a lot of those independents are breaking, and even many Democrats walking away, many running away, which they should. Joe DeGeneva on talk radio this morning says that uh, Meadows and Jordan should file a grievance with the speaker. <clears throat> he says that members of Congress cannot be denied the right to perform their duties on these uh, count on these uh, committees they're on. <clears throat> well, I do not know the Senate, the Senate rules, the House rules. I don't really know how that works. As far as I've always understood, the House chairman or the Senate chairman, the chairman of any committee pretty much runs a committee. And he can pretty much make up any rules he wants. So Meadows and Jordan should certainly file a grievance. They should certainly raise hell. Uh, the fact that they're not being invited to question Rodenstein they should certainly raise hell about that. Should make it perfectly clear they're not happy, which they have done. Whether or not they have any remedy for that to force Goodlatte or Gowdy to let them uh, be the questioners, I don't know. I just don't know. But it's awfully suspicious. And again, I, I don't dislike Goodlatte. I think he's basically a decent old guy, but he's older than dirt. The guy's like blinking all the time. His eyes are all squinted. He's retiring. Trey Gowdy is retiring. These are two guys who are going to be leaving. Why did why did Goodlatte, I mean, if Goodlatte just wanted two people in there or whatever, then I would have put Meadows and Jordan. Why did Goodlatte make it him and Gowdy? What's up with that? Well, I'll tell you what's up with that. Because Rodenstein probably said, I ain't going anywhere near where Meadows and Jordan are there. Because they'll ask real questions. They'll really make me squirm. I want good old Uncle Bob Goodlatte, who's getting ready to retire doesn't want to make any waves on his way out the door, would like to tell everybody that they did a thorough investigation and that uh, there were some things that shouldn't have happened, but uh, they just want to get it all out there so it's out in the record so that we can make uh, various corrections so these things don't happen again. And of course, Trey Gowdy's worried, uh, focused on his own personal career. He's not going to do anything that's going to, uh, you know, blow the roof off the place on his way out the door. Why would he do that? That's not, that's, you wouldn't do that. And he won't. Meadows and Jordan would beat on uh, Rodenstein like a red-headed stepchild with no mercy. Meadows and Jordan should be doing the questioning, not uh, not uh, Goodlatt and, and uh, Gowdy, in my opinion. Whether or not they can force themselves into that situation, I don't know. I imagine if there's any way to do it, they would. Um... Who are they going to go to? Uh, Big ears, uh, Eddie Muster Ryan. Is he going to? Is he going to correct the situation? No. No, he's not. I don't blame Jordan and Meadows for being angry. I support him 100 percent. But whether or not they have some remedy to force Goodlatt and Gowdy to let them be in the hearings, I don't know. I just don't know. We're also learning now that. This wonderful deal that they cut with Rodent Steen, that the Rodent Steen interview will be classified and redacted and will li likely be held back for months, maybe even a year. How about that? Ain't that PG? Yes, that's right. We'll never really get to see that Rodent Steen interview, only bits and pieces, maybe a year down the road when it doesn't matter anymore because he'll likely be gone. Hmm. There's a lot going on here. Now, he's being, being given cover by the president because the president's most interested in getting rid of Uncle Bob the Executioner. And Rodenstein is the key to getting rid of Uncle Bob the Executioner. And it appears that Trump's made some headway as a result of that little conversation he had with Rod Rodenstein on the plane last week. He probably told Rodenstein, look, Rod, 
I got you by the short hairs, brother. I can throw you to the wolves, and your career is ruined, and you're probably going to go to jail. Or you can shut down that Mueller probe, make sure that I come out clean as a whistle, and that that thing gets shut down immediately after the midterms. Your choice, Rod. You play it however you want. I think that's probably what happened in that conversation with Trump and Rodenstein. So Trump's providing a little cover for Rodenstein. He's not giving him a full endorsement, but he certainly is providing some, some cover. It's kind of making House members mad, I think. But I think Trump has a longer-term plan. First, he's got to get rid of Uncle Bob the Executioner. He can't do anything until that happens. And a lot of the reasons why we're being told we can't get a lot of documents is because of Uncle Bob's investigation. So once Uncle Bob is gone, his investigation is over, then they no, no longer can use that as an excuse to withhold these documents. Documents which, in fact, will implicate Rodenstein in the crime, in the coup, the cover-up, the frame-up, whatever you want to call it. The Spygate conspiracy. Just a matter of time. The rat. The rat's going down. Rodenstein is going down, Mr. Tyler. Michael Avenetti, the creepy porn lawyer, has just suffered his third major setback in the last six months. So he had this lawyer that he worked at a law firm with who won a $10 million judgment against him back about four months ago. That ruling came down. He's fighting that, now trying to fight that so he don't have to fork over the 10 mil to his partner, his law partner, which he screwed. Now, it appears that the judge uh, has looked at a second case involving the same two, Avenetti, the porn lawyer, with this same lawyer, and another issue that they had, and the judge has again ruled against Avenetti, has now ruled for um, this other guy, this other lawyer, that uh, was in this law firm with uh, Avenetti, and he's ruled now that in addition to the $10 million, Avenetti has to pay this guy an additional $4.85 million. So that's now $14.85 million that Avenetti has to pay his former law partner. Now I guess we understand why he's out there doing what he's doing. He's trying to make a lot of money. He's trying to collect a whole bunch of cash. That's probably why he wants to run for president, so he can take in a lot of money that he can use to pay off his debt with this guy, this former this uh, lawyer who's a former law partner that, that he served with in uh, this law firm, and he's he owes this guy a lot of money, pretty close to 15 mil. So Avenetti's likely doing all this to get publicity, to do everything he can to raise the money to pay off this, uh, this uh, liability he has. It makes a lot of sense. But let's keep in mind that the judge also ruled, this other judge ruled in this latest case we talked about two weeks ago that went against him and Saggy Daniels, this ridiculous, frivolous uh, slander suit that he filed against Trump on behalf of Saggy. The judge threw that out and then told Avenetti a week later that in addition to throwing the case out, that Avenetti was going to be held accountable for Saggy's legal fees. So now in addition to the 10 mil ruling against him six months ago, which he's appealing or trying to fight. He's got another $4.85 million going against him now. In addition to that, he's got to pay Saggy's legal fees, which would be the fees that he would have charged himself. So, uh, But he's also got to pay... So he's not getting Saggy's money that she should have paid him. He's also got to pay Trump's attorneys. So Avenetti's on the hook also. I'm not sure how many million that is, but he's on the hook that he's got to pay Trump's attorneys as well. So you'll continue to see a lot of Avenetti out there because he needs to uh, put on one hell of a three-ring circus to raise the kind of money he's going to have to come up with to pay off all the people he screwed. And Democrats and the liberal left-wing media actually take this guy seriously. Shows you how effed up they are, huh? Madam Botox, Nazi Piglosi has told Dana Bash, she's also a horse face, that tr that uh, people are always asking her why she doesn't run for president. <laughs> I can't imagine people walking up to Nancy Pelosi and saying, gosh, Nancy, why don't you run for president? Come on now, Nancy. I think you're bullshitting. I think she's bullshitting us. I don't think nobody ever walked up to Nancy and said, hey, Nancy, why don't you run for president? You're so effing smart. 
We'd be great to have you as president. Bullshit. Bullshit. <laughs> oh, God. Okay, okay. But she tells horseface Dana Bash that people always ask her why she doesn't run for president. And she says because she loves the legislative process. <laughs> oh, God. This woman is too much. They must have pumped that Botox directly into her brain. Directly into the brain. Mr. Lips went right into the brain. But she says she's always encouraging Jerry Brown to run for president. Yeah, that would go real well. Jerry Brown. <laughs> he, would, he would win two or three, maybe four states. It would be a dramatic, massive electoral college landslide against Jerry Brown if he ever ran uh, for national office. And he knows it. That's why he doesn't do it. Even Jerry Brown's not stupid enough to take uh, Madame Botox's advice. <clears throat> She's also saying that Dems would easily win the House if the vote were today. And that was from a, uh, an interview she did um, a couple days ago. So she's clearly delusional. Delusional. Or she's just flat out lying combination of both. I don't know. The woman's crazy. Don't know if you've seen any recent interviews of Nazi Piglosi, uh, Madame Botox. She can hardly even complete a sentence. Her mind drifts and wonders so much that she'll be trying to, you know, talk about some topic and she can't even get one sentence on the topic without losing track in her mind of what she's talking about. And, and she completely goes from one thing to another thing. It's not even related. And then she jumbles over her words. I mean, she's a mess. She's a mess. Unbelievable. Well, my good friend Peter, up there in Washington, holding down the fort, is going to be mad at me. I forgot the dumbass of the week yesterday. So, I got it for you today, Peter. The dumbass of the week. Shouldn't surprise us. This person, of course, has been dumbass of the week so many times I can't even keep count. <coughs> Again, as is usually the case, fairly close competition. But I couldn't resist this one. It was just too funny. And if you get a chance to see the video clip, it's hilarious. What's hilarious about it is, is that you can tell that she really believes what she's saying. And that's, I don't know if that's frightening or funny. It's probably a little of both. But I'm talking about none other than Mad Max, Maxine Waters, the leader of the Democratic Party. So she's on MS, PMS, NBC, and she tells Joy Reid that the Republicans are afraid of the blue wave. They're very scared of the blue wave. <laughs> oh boy. Even that leader of the DNC, Tom Perez, is, is, is gone out and said that there ain't going to be a blue wave. He said, well, I was never talking about a blue wave. Blue wave? Uh, what are you talking about? I, know, I, I never said anything about a blue wave. Uh, I never I never said there'll be a blue wave. Hey, you know, we're looking for victory in whatever form we can get it in. And sometimes it's a moral victory. Yeah, that's what it is. It's going to be a moral victory. The Democrats can have a huge moral victory in uh, 2018 uh, and 2020 and beyond. We're just going to have lots of moral victories while we lose every election coming. <laughs> but uh, apparently Mad Max didn't watch Tom Perez because she's telling Joy Reid on MSPMS NBC that... Um, that uh, the Republicans are afraid of a blue wave. She also says, <laughs> she also says that there is collusion. There is collusion by the Republicans in order to undermine Democrats so that the Republicans can remain in power. <laughs> That's actually called politics, Maxine, Mad Max, you, member of your party, other members of your party, get together and put together plots and plans to try to defeat the other party to keep them out of power. That's called politics. That's the business you're actually in, Max. Somebody better remind her. I, I just did remind her of that. She apparently doesn't understand that. It's not called collusion. It's called your job. Politics. You crazy woman. See you guys tomorrow. Bye.